So uh, my name's Nish. Um, as I was said, I'm one of the uh, radiology registrars at Southampton, and I'm going to be giving um, an SBA tutorial today um, on radiology. Um, most of the questions I'm going to use are from the QuestMed um, bank. There are a few that I've made myself um, as well. Um, I'll try and explain everything um, that we talk about as much as I can. Um, the thing is with radiology, as I'm sure you're aware, it's a really big field and um, it kind of comes, uh, comes up in almost all your other specialties. So there's a lot to cover and I'm not going to try and cover everything. Um, instead, I'm just trying to try and concentrate on um, some specific things where maybe I can give you a few um, tips on how to approach um, common types of radiological um, investigations that you might uh, see as a student and as a junior doctor, um, rather than trying to cover everything. So um, what I am going to cover today um, is chest x-ray, specifically looking at um, lung, cardiac and mediastinal pathology, um, a little bit on bowel pathology in abdominal x-rays, and then a tiny bit on limbs, um, but obviously I'm not going to be able to cover it, um, all the bones in our body. Um, so I think we should just go straight into it. Um, so if we start with question one, um, I'll read out the question for you and the options, and then we'll give you a pause um, to um, vote in the poll. So the first question is a 67 year old female who presents to the emergency department with a three day history of productive cough with rusty brown sputum, fevers and shortness of breath. A diagnosis of pneumonia is suspected and a chest, X a chest radiograph sorry, is performed. Which lobe of the lungs is affected? Is it A, the lingular lobe, B, the left lower lobe, C, the right upper lobe, D, the middle lobe, or E, the right lower lobe. So we'll just give you um, 30 seconds to uh, vote and then we'll see what everyone thinks and we'll go through the answers, okay? So 10 more seconds. I think we can stop there and see what the answers are. So um, we've got 72% of people saying um, D, the middle lobe, 26% um, of people who are saying E, the right lower lobe, and then 3% saying the lingular lobe. So um, the answer here is um, what the majority of people thought. So it is the middle lobe. Um, so when we look at the chest radiograph, what we can see is that in the kind of right middle or lower part of the lung field, we can see this patchy shadowing, patchy pacification. So um, when you look at it, you can think, oh, it could either be in the, the middle lobe, um, which obviously sits uh, in the anterior part of the chest or the right side of the chest, or it could be the lower lobe, which would sit in the posterior part. And the clue here is the fact that you can't see the right heart border very well at all. So if you compare it to the left heart border, which is incredibly clear, you just can't tell exactly where that right heart border is. Um, and the reason for that is because we've lost its silhouette. Um, and you lose, it, you lose the silhouette because there must, the consolidation in this lung must be sitting right up against the right heart border. Um, and which lobe of the lung sits against the heart border, uh, the right heart border, that would be the middle lobe. Um, so, as I said, the silhouettes um, of the heart and the diaphragmatic borders, they're created by having a difference in density between the aerated lung on one side and the heart or diaphragmatic tissue on the other side. So if you lose that density for whatever re uh, difference in density, sorry, for whatever reason, um, for example, if you've got consolidation and pus in all your alveoli, um, you tend to lose the silhouette. Um, so if you get consolidation in specific um, lobes of the lung, you can lose specific silhouettes. For example, if you lose, uh, sorry, if you lose your um, left hemidiaphragm, or the outline of your left hemidiaphragm, then that would suggest that you've got consolidation in your left lower lobe. As we said, if you lose your right um, heart border, then the consolidation must be in the middle lobe. If you lose the left 
uh, hemidiaphragm, then the consolidation is going to be in the left lower lobe. Um, the lingula sits right up against the left heart border, so loss of the left heart border means consolidation in your lingula. Um, and then your aortic arch sits right up against your um, left upper lobe. So again, um, if you can't see the um, aortic arch for whatever reason, that suggests there's consolidation in the upper lobe there. Um, the one lobe that isn't included in any of this is the right upper lobe. Um, and that's because it sits next to the um, superior vena cava. And the thing is, you can't really see the superior vena cava on most um, um, chest x-rays. So it's not particularly useful to say that you, you've lost its silhouette. Right, so uh, question two. Um, you've got a 70-year-old male with a 30-pack year smoking history. He presents with a one-week history of shortness of breath. He reports his clothes have become baggy over the last three months. On examination, his oxygen saturations are 85% on room air, um, and there is dullness to percussion over the left lung base. So the radiograph is on the right. What does the radiograph show? Is it A, right middle lobe pneumonia, B, left upper lobe collapse, C, right-sided pneumothorax, D, right-sided pleural effusion, or E, left lower lobe collapse. So I should have said D was left-sided pleural effusion, not right-sided. So another 10 seconds. I think we can stop there. So um, we've got 58% of people um, who say that this is left lower lobe collapse. And then we've got 19% of people who say right-sided pneumothorax. Um, and then 16% who say it's a left-sided pleural effusion, um, and then a minority of people who think this is a, a left upper lobe collapse. So the answer here is um, left lower lobe collapse. Um, so what we're seeing on the chest x-ray um, is what's called a left, uh, sorry, a double left heart border sign. So you've got the left heart border just here, um, but then you have the second very well-defined line that also might look like a heart border and then within this area you've got dense shadowing um, and you'd almost say it looks like a triangular sail on a on a yacht or something like that so this is um, classic for left lower lobe uh, collapse and the clue in the history is that this patient you'd be suspicious has a lung malignancy and often uh, malignancies can um, obstruct um, bronchi and cause collapse of the distal um, distal lobes of um, whichever relevant lung we're talking about. So uh, the definition of lobar collapse is um, obviously the collapse of an entire lobe of the lung. When we're thinking about its causes, we can think of luminal, mural, and extramural causes. So luminal causes um, include uh, mucus plugging, so people who um, get lots of infections or have uh, chronic inflammation in the lungs and often um, produce lots of thick mucus that block off um, bronchi and cause collapse. Um, foreign bodies, endobronchial masses, um, and misplaced um, ET tubes. And what I mean by this is, um, Obviously, an um, endotracheal tube is supposed to sit in the trachea um, and allow you to ventilate both lungs. If you send it too far and put it in one, one of the bronchi instead of in the trachea, you end up ventilating one lung, but the other lung is completely um, blocked off um, and ends up collapsing because it's not getting any ventilation. Mural causes are commonly um, malignancy and extramural causes are um, uh, come about um, via uh, extrinsic con compression of the bronchi and again often is caused by malignancy. 
low bar collapse has uh, very specific patterns on chest x-rays. And I think um, if you can learn the patterns, it makes it very easy for you in an exam. Um, so we'll just go through all the different patterns for each um, type of low bar collapse. So if we start with the left upper lobe, um, what you get when the left upper lobe collapses is this veil-like density over the whole uh, left lung. It's, it kind of has a gradient, so it's greater at the top than it, or at the apex than it is at the bottom. Um, you'll also see that the um, left hemidiaphragm is, becomes raised and the left hilum also becomes raised. And this is a consequence of the fact that you've lost a lot of volume in that side. Therefore, the diaphragm um, comes up to, as a reaction to the loss of volume. Um, then you've got right upper lobe collapse, um, which gives you either a triangular or sometimes an S-shaped density in the right upper, upper zone of the lung, along with um, raising of the right hemidiaphragm and raising of the right hilum. Some people talk about the golden S sign um, in right upper lobe collapse. And this is um, when you see, as I said, an S-shaped um, contour to this density. Um, that the kind of the rounded part of the S comes up is thought to be the malignancy or mass that is causing the obstruction. So obviously not every um, right upper lobe collapse is, is secondary to an, um, a mass obstructing it. So you don't always get an S shape and sometimes it can just be a triangle instead or a straight line, sorry, I should say. Um, when we look at the right middle lobe, um, what you get is a triangular density in the middle zone of the lung. Um, the right hemidiaphragm comes up, obviously, because you've lost some volume in the lung. And then you also lose the right heart border for exactly the same reasons that we talked about in the previous question, um, because the collapsed lung is a, is a lot more dense than the aerated lung. Um, and therefore, you lose that difference in density between the right heart border and the collapsed lung. Then the right lower lobe gives you what's called the sail sign. So it's um, basically the mirror image of what we saw in the last, um, in this question. So you get a triangular sail-like density, which is very well defined. Um, in the right lower part of the lung, your right hemidiaphragm will come up and your right hilum comes down. Because if you imagine the hilum is getting dragged down by um, the lack of volume on in the lower part of the lung. And then the left lower lobe is what we saw um, in this question. So again, you get the sail sign with a left, uh, with the double left heart border, a raised left hemidiaphragm and a depressed left hilum. So if you can remember these patterns, um, it'll be very easy um, when you're presented with one of these, um, one of these chest x-rays in either an SBA or in an OSCE uh, to be able to come up with the right answer. So uh, next question, question three. Um, we've got a 20-year-old male who's brought, uh, who's brought in by ambulance to the emergency department. He was a restrained front seat passenger in a road traffic accident. He is complaining of left-sided pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. His vital signs are stable, um, is given analgesia and sent uh, for a chest x-ray. While he is in the x-ray department, he becomes more short of breath. His heart rate begins to rise and his blood pressure begins to fall. You are called to review him in the x-ray room as he is quickly becoming unstable. You review the x-ray that has just been taken. What is the next immediate step that should be taken? Is it A, admit for observation and a repeat chest x-ray the following day? B, arrange a CT thorax to assess the underlying lung parenchyma, C, urgent cricothyroidotomy, D, uh, urgent needle decompression followed by a chest strain, E, analgesia for musculoskeletal pain. So if you'd like to vote now. So another 10 seconds. And we'll stop there. 
So um, the vast majority of people have said um, urgent needle de decompression followed by a chest drain. Um, and this is the correct answer. So um, the chest X-ray shows a pneumothorax and we can see that because um, if we look at the left side, we can't see any lung markings at all um, anywhere in the lung. If we look really carefully, if we look at the medial part, we can see this line here and this is the outline of the left lung. So it's clearly collapsed right down um, because there's a whole bunch of air in the left pleural spaces or space, I should say. Um, but more than that, we have uh, reasons to believe that this is a tension pneumothorax. Firstly, he's becoming hemodynamically unstable with his raising heart, rising heart rate and um, falling BP. Um, and then we've got radiographic features of retention as well, because um, if we look at where the heart is, so normally you'd expect to see the left heart border sitting somewhere around here. Can't see that at all. Normally the right heart border would sit somewhere around here, but we can see that it's been shifted right across to the right and we're seeing a lot more of the right side of the heart than we normally would. So this um, suggests that there's mediastinal shift. The trachea isn't particularly easy to see, but I think it might be a little bit deviated away from um, the left side, so towards the right. Um, and a slightly subtle sign, um, but if we look at the rib spacing on the left side, it looks slightly greater than the rib spacing on the um, right side. And these are all signs of tension. And if you suspect a tension pneumothorax, then what you need to do is um, an urgent needle decompression um, in order to relieve the, um, to relieve the tension. Um, and then obviously the patient will need a chest drain um, irrespective of how, how big the um, pneumothorax is after you've decompressed it. So pneumothorax is defined as air between the parietal and visceral layers of the pleura. Um, its causes can be uh, defined as primary, secondary, and um, traumatic or iatrogenic. So primary um, pneumothoraces are basically those that occur with no underlying lung disease. So classically, we're talking about tall, thin patients, often males, can get spontaneous pneumothoraces. Um, and then there are patients with specific uh, connective tissue disorders, such as Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, who are uh, more likely um, to have spontaneous pneumothoraces. Um, and then one that I think is a little bit contentious is people who've got um, alpha-1 alpha antitrypsin deficiency. Um, so as you may know, people who have this disease um, can often end up getting um, COPD-like lung diseases um, quite early on in life. Um, so for some reason, they're considered primary, but if they have what looks like COPD, then you might think that that's actually secondary. Um, secondary um, pneumothoraces are those that have lung disease, so commonly emphysema, asthma, uh, cystic fibrosis, or end-stage fibrosis. And then traumatic or iatrogenic pneumothoraces often caused by um, either direct trauma, so as in this example, in a car accident, or mechanical ventilation, where the ventilatory pressures are high enough to cause um, rupture of alveoli, um, or central line insertions, where um, the introducing wire can go through the through um, commonly like subclavian vein um, into the pl um, pleural space and then let air into that area. So the radiographic features of the pneumothorax, I've explained when I was going through um, the question, but they include the fact that you can't see lung markings that extend all the way to the edge of the lung fields, being able to see a visible lung border within the thorax, um, having partial or uh, total collapse of the um, lung that has the pneumothorax. And then there are some additional features of tension um, that you always have to look for. If you if you see a pneumothorax, you always have to look for features of tension. Um, and they include mediastinal shift away from the pneumothorax, tracheal deviation away from the pneumothorax, depression of the hemidiaphragm on that side, and increasing in the ribs, increased um, rib spacing. Um, so all these features of tension you can imagine are things that you might get if you've got lots of pressure on that side of the thorax that are pushing structures away from it. 
So um, this is an example of a simple pneumothorax. So um, you can see that we can't see any lung markings in the apices. If we look really carefully, we can see that there is a visible lung border on the left, um, just down here. And then this lung looks a little busier than this, um, sorry, the left lung looks a little busier than the right lung. And that's because it's partially collapsed due to the fact there's air in the pleural space. And then if we go back to the um, chest x-ray that we were showing in the question, um, we've got all those same features of a simple pneumothorax, but we've also got the mediastinal shift, uh, the tracheal deviation, the increased rib spacing, and the depressed um, left hemidiaphragm here. So you, you know that this diaphragm is um, depressed because a normal hemidiaphragm is kind of it gently curves and then it becomes a lot sharper towards the costophrenic angle and then you get a nice acute costophrenic angle at the edges. On this side you see um, it's not really gently curving and when you get to the costophrenic angle um, it's quite a lot more uh, quite a lot wider than um, on the right side so this suggests um, that this diaphragm is pushed down. There's also a tiny um, pleural effusion which often comes with um, a pneumothorax. So management, um, as I said, if it's tension, then you need to have an urgent uh, needle, de uh, needle thoracostomy for decompression. If it's simple, um, always approach it as an A, B, C, D, E, as I'm sure you've learned everything in medical school, that's the first answer. Um, the actual management, its options uh, include surveillance, aspiration, or a chest drain. Um, and this all depends on whether it's primary or secondary um, and how big it is. Um, the B BTS um, have produced this flow chart in their latest um, guidance, which was 2010, on how to manage spontaneous pneumothoraces. Um, it's the kind of thing that you'd probably learn for an exam, um, and then you'd forget once you're a doctor because there's no point in mem memorizing this. You can just go and look it up if you need to. Um, the only thing that's worth knowing is that if you are going to measure the size of a pneumothorax, you're supposed to do it at the level of the hilum. So you, you measure it horizontally um, at the same level that you can see the hilum on that side. If you want more detail um, about how to manage pneumothoraces, then I suggest you go and read the BTS um, Plural Diseases Guidelines um, from 2010. It goes into huge amounts of detail and also includes information on um, when to um, when to consider things like suction or referral to cardiothoracic um, surgery and things like that. So question four, we have a 76 year old man who presents to the emergency department with shortness of breath. His previous history includes ischemic heart disease, hypertension and mild COPD. On examination, he is hypoxic on room air with saturations of 92% tachycardic and uh, tachypneic. He has bibasal crepitations and his JVP measures six centimeters. A chest radiograph is performed and it's on the right. Which of the following is the best initial management option? So is it A, oral doxycycline and prednisolone, B, IV frusamide, C, IV amoxicillin, D, CPAP, E, subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin. So I'll give you 30 seconds to answer. Uh, 10 more seconds. So I think we'll stop there. So 78% uh, of people have said um, IV frusamide. We've got 13% uh, who have said CPAP, and then 7% who've said IV amoxicillin, and 2% uh, have said um, oral doxycycline and prednisolone. Um, so the answer here is IV frusamide. Um, so the diagnosis is um, pulmonary edema probably secondary to heart failure. So um, how do we come to that conclusion? Well, firstly, um, the history 
um, say, shows that he's got a few risk factors for heart failure. So he's got ischemic heart disease and hypertension. He is hypoxic. Um, the only slightly confounding factor here is that his saturations are 92 on room air and he's got COPD. Um, but the question says he's got mild COPD. So it's unlikely um, that he is going to be um, a, not a CO2 retainer. So this is unlikely to be normal for him. Um, so he's probably going to be true hypoxia. On top of that, he's got bibasal crepitations, which are a classical finding in um, pulmonary edema, um, as well as a raised JVP at six centimeters. So just reading the history, we're quite suspicious that this is going to be pulmonary edema. Um, and then when we see the chest radiograph, we can see that there's bilateral patchy um, shadowing, which is um, more pronounced um, at the lower zones and also towards the hyla um, as opposed to the peripheries. There's a tiny pleural effusion here. Can't really see the heart, but you've got the sense that it might be here on the, on the right and here on the left, so it might be a little bit big. Um, so it's all looking like pulmonary edema. And the initial management of um, pulmonary edema is obviously ABC approach, um, but in terms of um, pharmaceutical uh, therapies, IV fruzamide would be the first thing you try. If you've given someone, if you've treated somebody aggressively with IV fruzamide and other heart failure medications, um, but they're still not improving um, or they're critically unwell, then um, CPAP would be an option, um, but this it's rare that this is the first thing you would try. And in this patient whose saturations are not normal, but they're not catastrophic on room air, um, you, you'd think that you've probably got the option to try some IV fruzamide before you have to escalate to CPAP. Um, oral doxycycline and prednisolone would obviously be the treatment of a mild exacerbation of COPD. Um, often, um, exacerbations of COPD don't have any findings on a, on a chest radiograph. Um, so you'd expect to kind of see a normal chest radiograph if that was what was going on. IV amoxicillin would be um, a treatment for um, community-acquired pneumonia. Um, again, you're more likely to see unilateral pneumonia, but that's not to say you can't get bilateral pneumonia. Um, but again, the history doesn't quite fit with pneumonia here. And um, subcut low molecular weight heparin would obviously be if you thought this was a PE. Again, you're more likely to have a normal chest radiograph um, in PE than have actual findings. So um, pulmonary edema is defined as the accumulation, sorry, the accumulation of fluid in the extravascular spaces of the lung parenchyma. Typically, this is um, the alveoli, but it doesn't just have to be that. So it can also get into the um, intralobular sector um, and give you um, certain features that you can see on a chest film. And it's, it's also often a spectrum. So as a medical student, you're mo most likely to be tested on the absolute extreme version of pulmonary edema that you'll see on a chest film. But you should be aware that there's um, quite a big spectrum um, and mild pulmonary edema is very hard to diagnose on a chest x-ray and you often um, have to kind of put it together with what you're seeing with the patient and their risk factors in order to um, in order to diagnose it. So um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the ABCDEF of pulmonary edema but there it's a way of remembering the um, findings on the chest radiograph. So A stands for alveolar edema so that's this patchy um, bilateral shadowing that is um, more prominent in the perihyla regions. And this is also called bat wing shadowing. It's the thing that you're taught about as a medical student, um, but it's actually relatively rare um, in real life because it's a really extreme feature of pulmonary edema. B is um, curly B lines. So curly B lines are these um, really fine lines that you find um, at the peripheries and at the bases um, of the lungs. Um, you have to look really carefully for them. Um, what they represent is fluid in the intralobular sector. Um, often because of both technical factors and uh, the fact that they're rare in themselves, you don't see them. Um, just as a tip in an exam, if you're saying you're looking for curly B lines, then you have to be 
and making a big um, song and dance about looking specifically in the peripheries at the bases um, to prove that you're really looking for them. Um, C is cardiomegaly, so large heart. Um, so on a, on a PA chest film, um, the heart should be no greater than half the size of the um, thorax, so edge of the lung to edge of the lung. If it's greater than that, then you can say cardiomegaly. If you've got an AP film, then you can't call cardiomegaly um, because um, the heart becomes um, projected um, because it's got a further distance to go between um, where the x-rays hit it and where the x-ray plate is. So it, it looks a lot larger than it might be. So you can only call it on a PA film. Um, D stands for diverted um, pulmonary vasculature um, or the other way of saying that is um, prom, um, is upper lobe diversion. So that's seeing um, really prominent um, pulmonary arteries and veins going to the upper lobes. Um, and that's because um, the blood flow is interrupted or um, has a higher resistance in the lower lobes because of all the edema. Therefore, it's shunted to the upper lobes where you can still get some ventilation. Um, it's not a great example on the um, on this film, but there's probably an upper lobe artery just here, which is a bit prominent. Normally, you wouldn't really see them at all. So E stands for effusion. So there's a small um, left-sided pleural effusion here because you can't see the uh, costophrenic angle. Um, and there might be a tiny one at the right base as well. So often um, in heart failure or in pulmonary edema, the effusions are bilateral. Um, they can either be small or big, um, and you can't really predict that to, um, based on anything else. An F is fluid in the horizontal fissure. So if you can see a really clear line somewhere around here in the middle, um, middle zone of the right, um, right lung field, it's possibly this here, um, that would be fluid in the horizontal fissure. And again, it just goes with pleural effusion. Right, next question. You've got a 35 year old female who works as a shopkeeper um, and presents with long standing non productive cough and breathlessness on walking uphill. She does not report any weight loss. On examination, she has red painful, sorry, red painful rash on her shins. Chest radiograph is on the right. What is the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, sarcoidosis, B, lymphoma, C, pneumonia, D, heart failure, or E, silicosis? So if I give you 30 seconds to answer. So 10 more seconds. I think we'll stop there. So we've got 84% um, of people who say a sarcoidosis. Um, then we have 7% uh, who say lymphoma, 5% uh, say heart failure, and 2% apiece who say pneumonia and uh, silicosis. So uh, the answer here is sarcoidosis. Um, so how do we come to that conclusion? Well, first of all, um, we've got someone who's got a non-productive cough and breathlessness. She's quite young. Um, and importantly, she has no weight loss. Um, the examination finding is quite telling. So you've got this red, uh, red painful rash on both her shins. Um, and this is a kind of nice description of erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum has loads of causes. A lot of them are autoimmune, uh, but one of them that you should know about is um, sar sarcoidosis. And then when we look at the chest radiograph, um, what we can see is in both hyalur regions, there's um, the both hyalur look quite large and they look a little bit bulky and lobulated on both sides. So we're thinking, um, is there hyalur abnormality here? Um, is could it be hyalur lymphadenopathy? So when we see hyalur lymphadenopathy, then 
uh, if you've got bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, you're thinking it's either sarcoid or it's lymphoma commonly. The fact that she's not lost any weight would push us more towards sarcoid than lymphoma in this question. And that's how we come to the answer. Um, so hilar enlargement, um, when we're thinking about hilar enlargement, we should consider that what we should consider what actually makes up the hilum. So the hilum is made up of a bronchus, a pulmonary artery, a pulmonary vein, um, and then lymph nodes um, that are adjacent to these structures. The actual cause of um, hilar enlargement can be due to any of these things. And the, the actual list is really long, but as medical students, I don't think you need to know um, this list. And if you see hilar enlargement, then you should basically be thinking hilar lymphadenopathy as your main, as your main uh, underlying cause. Um, so when we're thinking of hilar lymphadenopathy, um, you should consider is it unilateral or bilateral? So if it's unilateral, then it might be reactive nodes from an infection. It might be a malignancy. So either a, um, nodal metastases from a malignancy within um, the lung itself or a mass that's sitting right next to the hilum that you can't really differentiate from the hilum. If it's bilateral, then you're thinking more along the lines of sarcoidosis or lymphoma. And if it's lymphoma, it's far more likely to be Hodgkin's than it is non-Hodgkin's. Um, and then your other options are um, metastatic malignancy. Um, so widespread nodal disease, um, for example, um, atypical infection um, or silicosis. So uh, next question, we have a 45 year old male who presents with severe chest pain radiating to the back starting two hours earlier. His previous medical history includes poorly controlled hypertension and type two diabetes. Examination and his ECG are unremarkable. A chest radiograph is performed and is on the right. What is the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, pulmonary edema, B, aortic dissection, C, low bar pneumonia, D, lymphoma, or E, tension pneumothorax? So I'll give you 30 seconds to answer. So 10 more seconds. I think we'll stop there. So we've got 89% um, of people who are saying aortic dissection and then 4% of people who are saying pulmonary edema and low bar pneumonia and then 2% who are saying tension pneumothorax. So um, the answer here is um, aortic, B, aortic dissection. Um, so we come to that conclusion um, because the history is very suggestive. So we've got severe chest pain radiating to the back. So if you've got anyone with chest pain radiating to the back, um, then you have to seriously consider aortic dissection as one of your diagnoses. Um, along with that, he's got poorly controlled hypertension, which is basically the strongest risk factor for an aortic dissection. Um, and then, um, looking at the chest radiograph, um, we've got a mediastinum that looks very wide. Um, so we can see a lot of the aorta here uh, coming down. And then we're also seeing, not 100% sure what this mediastinal structure here is, but we can tell that um, if we look at the, di the diameter of this mediastinum here, it's probably about half the size of the chest. So that's not normal. Otherwise, um, you might look at the left base and say it's quite dense down there, um, but this is likely to be because it's a um, underpenetrated film because we can still see the silhouette of the left hemidiaphragm and we can still see the silhouette of the left heart border. So there can't be any true consolidation down there um, if we can still see those things. You can see the lung markings right to the edges, so there's no pneumothorax. Um, lymphoma is an option because we're thinking there's something wrong with the um, mediastinum, but um, lymphoma often looks bulky. 
um, whereas this looks a lot smoother. So it's very unlikely to be the case in this, um, in this um, example. So mediastinal widening, um, there's no actual concrete definition of what a mediastinal, a widened mediastinum is, which is, you know, very annoying. Um, but when you're thinking about causes, um, one of the things you have to consider is, is it a technical cause? Because that's by far the most common reason why you see mediastinal widening. So what I mean by that is if you've got an AP film, so for exactly the same reason that you can't look at the heart properly on an AP film, you also can't look at the mediastinum um, in that much detail because it, it gets projected as larger than it is. Um, if the patient's even slightly rotated, the mediastinum looks wider. And um, if the patient is tilted or lordotic, um, that can make the mediastinum look much wider than it really is. So when you've got a film where you think there's mediastinal widening, they're the first things that you have to rule out. If you're happy that none of those things could explain uh, what you're seeing, then you can think of other causes. And again, then the number of causes is pretty vast. Um, common ones as a medical student you probably want to know about are vascular causes. So um, is there an aortic dissection or aneurysm? Um, or is it just variant anatomy? For example, have they got a double superior vena cava? Um, it's rare, but it does happen. Um, and the other thing is, are there masses within the mediastinum that we're seeing? So thymic tumors, lymphomas, lung masses, or lymphadenopathy. Um, and this is one of those things where history and examination and correlation with the patient in front of you is really important. Um, because if you're just doing a routine chest X-ray um, in a completely asymptomatic patient, and you see what you think is a widened mediastinum, then the chances that they're having a dissection that you've not that they don't know about and you don't know about is very low. Um, whereas if you've got like, in this case, a patient who's in severe chest pain radiating to the back and has this um, widened mediastinum on their chest film, then you're gonna be a lot more suspicious and you're going to uh, want to act on that. Um, you're gonna have a much lower threshold to act on it uh, than you would in the first example. So question seven, so we're moving away from the chest now and onto the abdomen. Um, so we've got a 63-year-old female who presents with abdominal pain, vomiting, constipation, and bloating. She reports that she has not opened her bowel for five bowels for five days and cannot recall the last time she passed wind. Her previous surgical history includes a right-sided uh, right mesh hernia repair and a cholecystectomy. An abdominal radiograph is performed. What is the most likely diagnosis? So the film is on the right. So is it A, small bowel obstruction, B, large bowel obstruction, C, sigmoid volvulus, D, cecal volvulus, or E, toxic megacolon. So 10 more seconds. And I think we'll stop there. So um, we've got a little bit of a split here. So we've got 61% of people who say this is small bowel obstruction, 24% who say this is large bowel obstruction, 11% um, who say toxic megacolon, and then 2% of people who are saying sigmoid or sequel volvulus. So the answer here is small bowel obstruction. Um, so let's work out um, how we've come to that conclusion. So um, the history has a few clues. So the patient um, has had a previous surgical history um, with a mesh repair and a, well, predominantly a mesh repair. The cholecystectomy is less, um, less relevant. So um, people who have had abdominal surgery, um, particularly um, hernia repairs, are at risk of getting um, small bowel obstruction due to adhesions. And then when we look at the um, plain film, what we can see is, granted, you can't see all of the bowel um, and it's cut off quite a lot of what's on the left, um, but we can see some dilated loops of bowel that are predominantly in the center. Um, and then they have these um, 
structures that pass all the way across um, the diameter of the bowel. And these are called valvular conventes, and these are um, found only in small bowel. So this tells us that we've got small bowel obstruction. The other clue we've got is that we can't... So if you imagine where the um, cecum and the ascending colon and the transverse colon would sit, we can't see, we can barely see any air within it, um, which would suggest that it's all collapsed down. So all the large bowel has collapsed, which means the blockage must be in the small bowel. Um, sigmoid and cecal volvulus we'll talk about a bit later, so I'm not going to go into detail about why they are not the case here. Um, toxic megacolon um, would give you dilated large bowel, which would be um, featureless. Um, and might have some thumbprinting in it. Um, we can tell this isn't, another reason we can tell this isn't large bowel is that there's just far too much of it here. Um, and we couldn't really um, explain to ourselves how all of this bowel could possibly make up ascending, transverse and descending um, colon. So, when we're thinking about bowel obstruction, we obviously need to split it into small bowel and large bowel. So small bowel makes up 80% of bowel obstructions. And then its causes can be split into factors that are outside the bowel, factors that are inside the bowel wall, and then factors that are inside the bowel lumen itself. Um, so the most important factors are those that are outside of the bowel. So adhesions um, is by far the most common cause of um, small bowel obstruction in the Western world. Um, hernias, so the books would tell you that hernias are um, either the second most common or equal most common cause of small bowel obstruction, but actually um, more recent studies have shown that they're really not that common um, in the Western world, um, but they are still um, tested quite heavily and um, I think a lot of the books and probably a lot of medical school resources would still say hernias are very common. Um, but just be aware that's not quite as true as it used to be. Um, other factors that are in, uh, that are within the bowel wall include inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease um, and appendicitis. And then um, factors that are actually within the bowel themselves include uh, malignancies that are obstructing um, the lumen. Um, very rare in the small bowel. Um, foreign body ingestion, again, tends to be quite rare because um, if the foreign body can pass um, through the gastroesophageal junction, the, the chances are that it's um, small enough to pass through any other part of the small bowel. Um, and gallstone ileus, which is um, extremely rare, but it's when a gallstone erodes itself into the small bowel and travels along it, and then it gets to um, what's called Meckel's point which is the uh, narrowest part of the small bowel, and then it's too big to get through there and it causes small bowel obstruction. Um, it is extremely rare, but you do see a few cases a year of that um, in a hospital. Then large bowel obstruction, um, as I said, is far less common, and the biggest um, cause is going to be colonic tumor. So you've got a patient who presents with large bowel obstruction, that's probably the first thing you're gonna be considering. Um, other causes include strictures, often secondary to diverticular disease or um, inflammatory bowel disease or post-surgical anastomoses. Um, and then things like volvulus, either sigmoid or uh, cecal, and then rarely hernias and adhesions. Um, so when you've got a abdominal film and you're trying to work out, is this um, small bowel or large bowel um, that looks abnormal? There are a few things that can help you. So its position is useful. So typically small bowel will sit within the center. Um, of the abdomen, whereas a large bowel will sit in the peripheries. If you're trying to decide whether it's actually um, dilated or not, then you, you need to have a number. Um, often, obviously, in an exam, you won't be given a ruler or any kind of measurement, so you won't actually be able to say for sure that this is dilated, but you can say whether it looks dilated or not. Um, when you are allowed to measure it, small bowel should be no more than three centimeters in diameter. Um, large bowel should be no more than six, um, unless it's the cecum, which should be no more than nine. So some people like to remember the three, six, nine rule, small bowel, large bowel, cecum. 
And then there are certain features that the bowel have um, that help you distinguish whether it's large or small bowel. So you've got um, valvuli conventes in the small bowel, and they cross the full width of the bowel. And basically what they are, are just mucosal folds within the small bowel that you can see. Um, and they tend to be more prominent when you've got dilatation. Um, conversely, in the large bowel, you've got haustra. Um, and haustra don't, they cross no more than two thirds of the bowel width. So these are haustra just here. So there's a haustra there. There are lots of haustra everywhere. Um, they look a lot thicker than valvular conventes. And again, these are mucosal folds within the large bowel. Um, and they're formed when you get circumferential um, contraction of the inner mucosal layer of the large bowel. Okay, so question eight. So we've got a 76 year old lady who presents to the emergency department with left iliac fossil pain for one day with associated vomiting and rigors. Her white cell count is 14.9, CRP is 220 with a lactate of 2.8. Her vital signs um, are temperature of 38.9, heart rate of 110, blood pressure of 100 over 80, and respiratory rate of 25 breaths per minute. She has an abdominal film, which is on the right. Which sign is demonstrated on the x-ray? Is it A, lead pipe colon, B, string of pearls, C, double bubble, D, coffee bean, or E, wriggler sign? So another 10 seconds. I think we'll stop there. So 63% uh, of people say it's E Wrigler's sign, 20% uh, say it's coffee bean sign, 10% um, say string of pearls, and then 5% um, say lead pipe colon, and 3% say double bubble sign. So the answer here um, is E, Wrigler's sign. Um, I'll explain what Wrigler's sign is on, is on the next slide, but just to um, exclude the other options. So lead pipe colon um, is what you get when you get a thick inflamed ed edematous colon. Um, and it looks basically like a featureless um, thick walled colon that you can see on the um, abdominal film. Um, and we can't see any evidence of that here. String of pearls um, is a sign that you get when you do a standing abdominal x-ray. So um, normal abdominal x-rays are done with the patient lying down. Um, if you do it with a standing film, you get all the air going upwards um, and you get these tiny um, bubbles of gas that sit um, in between the valvular conoventes um, and they look like a tiny string of pearls. Um, Given that we don't really do standing abdominal films, I don't think it's a particularly relevant um, sign that for you to know about, and you probably won't ever see it in your lives. Um, the double bubble sign is a pediatric sign, um, and it um, occurs when you get um, gas in both the stomach and in the first part of the duodenum. Um, and it's a sign of basically um, duodenal obstruction, commonly duodenal atresia. Um, coffee bean sign we'll talk about um, later. So um, Wrigler's sign is essentially um, the ability to see um, the bowel wall really well. And that's because you've got air on both sides of the wall. And if we go back to what I was saying about um, the silhouette, so um, you get the silhouette because you've got um, big differences in density um, on one side compared to the other. So you've got air on one side of the bowel, then you've got the bowel itself, and then you've got air within the bowel. So you, that means that you can see the bowel wall really well. Um, so if we look at this film, um, we can see um, in the um, right pelvic or iliac fossa region, you've got this low density that looks like air, but it doesn't look like it's within bowel itself. And you've got um, bowel here that looks like cecum. Um, so we're not 100% sure where this air is going to be. But then on top of that, we can see the wall of the cecum really well, much better than you'd ever expect to be able to see it on a normal 
um, abdominal film. So this is Rigler sign right here. And there's another example of this. Um, if we look um, lower down in the pelvis. So again, we've got lots of um, low density stuff here, which looks like air. And then you've got bowel on top of it. And again, you can see the um, wall of the bowel so well, uh, much better than you, you should be able to see it. So Rigler sign is a, um, a sign that indicates you've got pneumoperitoneum, which is air in the peritoneal spaces. Causes, so there are three main causes you should think about. So number one is bowel perforation. Um, so if you've got someone coming into A&E with abdominal pain um, and they've got a pneumoperitoneum, then you should be thinking per perforation. The other things that you should consider are um, is it a penetrating injury to the abdomen? So has the air got in through, for example, a stab wound? Um, so you don't necessarily have to have um, perforated a, a bowel viscera in order to uh, get air within the abdomen. Um, and then the other thing is, is it post-surgical? So if you've had either a laparoscopic or an open um, procedure to your abdomen, you're obviously going to have introduced some air into the abdomen at that time. And it can take normally up to two weeks for the air to completely disappear. So it's not abnormal to see pneumoperitoneum um, on immediately post-operative patients. The features, so the features depend on which um, examination you perform. So if you do an erect chest x-ray, what you see is free air under the diaphragm. Um, and that's what you've got here. So you can see um, this very low density stuff under the right hemidiaphragm and again under the left hemidiaphragm and you've got liver edge there so you know that there's a whole bunch of air between the liver and the diaphragm um, and somewhere around here I think this is probably stomach and you've got a whole bunch of air between the stomach and the left hemidiaphragm. Um, just incidentally the patient's also got a really big hiatus hernia so that's probably only part of their stomach there. Um, and then if you do an abdominal x-ray, um, you get the regular sign that we talked about already. And then other signs that you might get um, include the falciform ligament sign. So if you go back to your anatomy, um, you might remember that the falciform ligament is um, the ligament that separates your left lobe of your liver from your right lobe. Um, and it sits basically in the roughly in the midline um, of the abdomen. And if you get air, lots of air in the abdomen, um, you can get air around the falciform ligament, ligament, which then makes it very obvious on a, on a radiograph. So just like this, you can see this vertical line, which is the falciform ligament. Um, and if you can see that, then that's abnormal and that suggests that you've got pneumoperitoneum. If you've got an SBA question or an OSCE station where they're asking you how you would first rule out um, perforation with a radiological investigation, the answer is an erect chest x-ray. Um, this is because this is far more sensitive than an abdominal x-ray um, is at picking up free air in the abdomen. So it's always erect chest x-ray if you're considering perforation. Obviously, if there's any doubt or if you've seen anything abnormal on your chest x-ray or your abdominal x-ray, the patient is very likely to go on to a CT anyway, um, but you, still, you should still know what the basic examinations that you can perform are in order to rule these things out. Um, question nine. So um, we've got an 83 year old lady who has developed abdominal distension and vomiting day 10 following the insertion of a left nephrostomy for pyelonephritis and ureteric obstruction. On examination, the abdomen is tympanic. The drain is patent and draining clear urine. The abdominal film is performed and is on the right. What sign is demonstrated on the x-ray? So is it A, the embryo sign, B, Rolfsing sign, C, football sign, D, coffee bean sign, or E, psoas sign. So 10 more seconds. And we'll stop there. So we've got 67% of the people who say um, D, coffee bean sign, 17% who say um, 
embryo sign, which was A, and then we've got 7%, you say SOAS sign, and 4% each, you say Rosvings and football sign. So uh, this is the first question where the majority have actually got it wrong. Um, so the people who said embryo sign are correct here. So hopefully I can persuade you that we've got what looks like a, a very large human embryo sitting right in the middle of the abdomen here. Um, so this is um, synonymous with uh, a sequel volvulus. Um, the history itself isn't particularly useful. Um, she's got abdominal distension and vomiting um, and a tympanic abdomen, which all just fits with bowel obstruction. So that's not going to help you. Um, so it's only really um, what the x-ray looks like that can help you get the answer here. Um, just to rule out a few of the other things, um, you've got Ros Rovsing sign is a sign in appendicitis. And what it is, is that when you press on the left iliac fossa, the patient complains of pain in the right iliac fossa. And it's, um, as I said, a sign for appendicitis. Football sign is predominantly a pediatric um, sign um, in abdominal films, where if you've got a huge amount of um, air within the abdomen, a pneumoperitoneum, um, you can see the median umbilical ligament and the falciform ligament really well. And it makes it the whole thing look like a, a kind of an American football with the ligaments appearing as the stitch in the middle. Um, not very common that you'll see it. Um, so I don't think it's critical that you know what that is. Um, and E, the psoas sign is basically, sometimes um, you can see this, the outline of the psoas muscles on an abdominal film. If you've got a mass or an abnormality right next to the um, psoas muscle, sometimes you can either see that, that is, the psoas muscle is larger or it's indistinct um, on that side, and that's called the psoas sign. So um, sigmoid and sequel volvulus. So you have to decide um, which one you think it is when you're um, shown an x-ray like that with a large single segment of really dilated um, bowel. So first thing you can say is it's very unlikely um, to be small bowel because small bowel can't get that big without perforating first. Um, so you know it's large bowel. Um, so the cecum and the um, sigmoid are particularly prone to volving because they're relatively free on their mesentery. So they've got lots of freedom um, to twist. Um, and when we're trying to decide um, which one we're looking at, there are a couple of things that can help us. So um, sigmoid volvulus gives us the coffee bean sign. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, it is said to arise from the left lower quadrant, obviously where the sigmoid sits, and then points up towards the right upper quadrant. Within it, you won't be able to see any haustra. And the other thing that can be really helpful is um, you get that you because you've got obstruction at that level, you'll get dilatation of the rest of the large bowel um, because of it. So the ascending, transverse, and descending colon should appear dilated. Um, in contrast, cecal volvulus gives you that embryo sign, which I showed you. Um, it arises from where the cecum is, which is the left lower quadrant, and it often points towards the left upper quadrant. Um, you can often still see haustra within them. Um, and instead of getting dilated large bowel, because obviously the cecum is right at the start of the large bowel, what you get is dilate, what you can get is dilated small bowel instead. So um, let's just look at a few radiographs just to um, point these things out. So if, if we look at the sigmoid volvulus, so hopefully you can appreciate there's what looks like a coffee bean in the middle of the abdomen here, a big coffee bean. And when I say it arises from the left lower quadrant, um, when you follow like the middle or the seam of the coffee bean, um, you can see that it starts from down here in the left lower quadrant. So that's what I mean by arises from. And then when we're saying where it points to is basically where the um, other end of that seam is sitting. So in this case, it's not really sitting um, in the right upper quadrant. It's kind of more sitting just in the midline. Um, but if we follow the edges of our, of our coffee bean, we can see that we can't see any haustral folds here. Um, and then also we've got um, um, dilated um, proximal large bowel, which 
tells that this must be sigmoid um, volvulus. In contrast, if we look at sequel volvulus, we've got that embryo that I showed you before. Um, the kind of um, line within the embryo, um, the bit that gives it its kind of head-like curve, um, that is where it arises from, and you can see that's from the right iliac fossa. Um, you can see a few haustries, so there's a haustra there, there's a haustra here. Um, I think there are a few haustra around here. Um, again, keep in keeping with sigmoid. Um, and then the other thing we can see is that there's, dilute, there's dilated loops of uh, small bowel um, elsewhere, so all around here. And we tell this is small bowel because we can see the valvuli conoventes. And then we can't see any large bowel because it's all collapsed. Okay, so question 10. Um, so we've got a 75 year old male who presents to the emergency department with pain in his left thigh. There is no overt history of trauma, although he recalls missing a step while walking down the stairs a couple of days ago. On examination, the left leg is held in flexion and externally rotated. There is decreased range of movement and extreme tenderness on palpation. What classification system would you use to grade this man's injury? So is it A, Weber's, B, Schatzker's, C, Winquist, D, Garden, or E, Gostillo Anderson. So 30 seconds. Um, 10 more seconds. So I think we'll stop there. So um, the vast majority of you have said um, D, garden classification, and then 13% uh, have said um, Weber's. So the answer here is garden. So um, what we can see is um, we've got a left neck of femur fracture here. So I've been pretty harsh because I haven't given you the um, right side to compare to, but hopefully what you can see is that the actual length of the neck looks abnormal. If we look really closely at the inferior portion of the neck, I think that there's probably a break in the cortex here and the um, distal femur itself looks um, quite, quite rotated. That's not how you should be seeing um, uh, the neck of a femur. And I'll show you an example uh, later on, um, which hopefully will make it a bit clearer. Um, just to rule out the other things, um, so Weber's would be how you'd classify a lateral malleolus ankle fracture. Um, Schatzker is for uh, tibial plateau. Um, Winquist is for femoral shaft fractures. And Gostillo Anderson is for open fractures. And I should, sorry, I should have said, Garden fractures, uh, garden classification is specifically for intracapsular fractures of the neck of femur, not for extracapsular. So um, when you've got hip fractures, the first thing you need to work out is, is it intra or extracapsular? Um, so an intracapsular is anything that um, fractures proximal to the intratrochanteric region. So um, normally they're called uh, subcapital, mid-cervical or basicervical fractures of the neck. Um, and they matter because, um, as I'm sure you're aware, the blood supply to the head of the femur um, comes retrogradely. So it comes from the capsule upwards. Um, so if you um, disrupt the bone um, within the capsule, you can often cut off the blood supply to the head of the femur, and that can lead to avascular necrosis and um, collapse of the femoral head in the long term, which is often why um, in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, you would replace, if you fractured any part of the int intracapsular neck of femur, you would replace the head um, when you treat it. And then extracapsular is anything um, that's from the intratrochanteric region um, to kind of the proximal um, shaft of the femur. So if you've got an intracapsular fracture, then you use the garden classification to classify it. Um, and it goes from type one to type four, and it basically goes in um, order of increasing severity. So type one is a incomplete fracture that's not displaced. Type two is a complete fracture that's not displaced. 
Uh, type three is a complete fracture that's only displaced um, slightly. So they say less than 50%. Um, and type four is a complete fracture that's displaced more than 50%. So this is the kind of thing you need to know as a medical student, but from my own experience, um, it's actually really rarely used um, in clinical practice. Um, most of the time, a intracapsular fracture is an intracapsular fracture no matter how bad it is. Um, and it's often treated the same no matter what, but that's not how you'd be taught as a medical student. So you would have to actually know the garden classification. Um, so find, seeing hip fractures on um, chest, on um, hip x-rays. So the first thing you want to look for is a break in the cortex of the neck of the femur. So you really want to look, you want to follow the outline of the bone and you want to be 100% sure that you can follow the cortex all the way around. Um, if you can't, then that would suggest that there is a fracture there. Um, something that's really helpful is what's called Shenton's line. So Shenton's line is made up by the inferior border of the neck of the femur and the inferior border of the su superior pubic ramus. And it should make this nice kind of semi-ovoid um, line if you trace them round. If you can't trace trace it round or there's a big step in it or that it doesn't look quite as... Um, quite as rounded as the other side, then that would suggest that there is a neck of femur fracture. This is an example, but it's not actually a fracture, it's a dislocation. So you can see the femoral head is not sitting in the acetabulum. Um, and it's a, yet again, another example of why Shenton's line might be disrupted. Um, other things you might see is an increased density. If you've got an impacted fracture, you might see kind of a line of increased density where that impaction is. Um, and other more subtle things you might see include um, prominence of the lesser trochanter because the hip has become externally rotated, um, which is one of the um, findings that you'll get on clinical examination as well. So management, I'm not going to go into detail management here. I'm sure you'll cover it in orthopedics, but basically intracapsular fractures um, will either get a total hip replacement or hemiarthroplasty. Um, there are a few very... Um, specific um, exclusions to that, but I'm not going to cover those. Um, if it's an extra capsular fracture, then you do either a dynamic hip screw or an iron nail. Okay, so question 11. A 69 year old female presents to the emergency department with pain um, and swelling of her right wrist um, after a fall onto her outstretched hand. So the radiograph is on the right. What is the eponymous term for this fracture? Is it A, a Montegia fracture? B, a Jefferson's fracture, C, a Colley's fracture, D, a Galeazzi's fracture, or E, a Smith's fracture. So 30 seconds again. And 10 more seconds. I think we'll stop there. So 84% uh, of people have said this is a Collie's fracture, 7% um, say Smith's, and 5% of piece say Galeazzi's and Jefferson's. So the answer here is um, a Collie's fracture. And I'll explain uh, in detail um, on the next slide um, why this is a Collie's fracture. Um, just to exclude the other thing. So a Montegui's fracture um, is an ulnar shaft fracture um, with dislocation of the radial head. So um, you wouldn't see it on a wrist film because it would normally be a little bit higher up the arm. Um, a Jefferson's fracture is a um, fracture of the C2 spinal vertebra. So again, wouldn't see it here. Um, a Galeazzi's um, is kind of the counterpart to a Montegui's fracture. So that is a distal radius fracture um, with dislocation of the radio ulna, the distal radio ulna joint. Um, it's distal radius, but it's not as distal as this. Often it's a little bit higher up the radius than this is. And then a Smith's is what's called a reverse collars, and we'll talk about that, that in just a second. So I just thought I'd talk about a few of the common hand and wrist fractures that you might get tested on as a medical student. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, um, but these are the eponymous names that they tend to like to bound about. Um, so the 
most common one is the college fracture. Um, the, me the common mechanism is a fall onto an extended outstretched hand. Um, so you can imagine how someone would um, put their hand out um, with their wrist in extension to try and um, break a fall. Um, and it's got very specific radiographic features. As, as with all eponymous names, they have to be, you have to have very specific uh, patterns of injury to be able to call them the eponymous fracture. So a collies is a distal radius fracture with dorsal displacement and angulation of the fracture fragment. So the fracture fragment is the part that's distal. Um, and we can see, so I've only given you one view and obviously hopefully in an exam, they'd give you two views, um, but you'll have to believe me that this is a radius that's fractured. Um, and what you can see is that the um, fragment of the radius is slightly displaced distally, so, uh, sorry, dorsally. So the dorsum of the hand is the back and the volar or palmar aspect is the front. So it's slightly displaced um, dorsally and is also slightly angulated towards the dorsal direction. So that's a collie's pattern of injury. Smith's is also known as a reverse collie's um, and that happens commonly when you fall onto a flexed outstretched hand um, and you get literally the opposite pattern of injury. Um, so it's again a distal radius fracture um, but this time the fracture fragment is displaced in the volar direction or towards the palm and is also um, angulated towards the volar direction. So here we can see it's um, displaced um, in the volar direction and the angle is going kind of in this direction here. Next one I'm going to talk about is the chauffeur's fracture. Um, so it either occurs because of direct trauma or forced dorsiflexion and abduction of the wrist. And it's, um, its name comes about from um, what chauffeurs with old tiny cars used to have to do where, I don't know if you've seen the old cars that have to be started with a crank. Um, and then once the engine is um, running on itself, um, on its own, the crank then um, can move very forcefully and it can cause you to dorsiflex um, and abduct the wrist, um, causing this fracture. And its specific pattern is that it's an intra-articular fracture of what's called the radial, uh, radial styloid. Um, and that's basically the tip of the radius. That's the radial styloid here. And here's our, um, here's our chauffeur's fracture. So the fracture extends into the joint space, so it's intra-articular. Um, scaphoid fracture, so it's not an eponymous name, but it is a fracture that you should know about. So commonly happens after you uh, fall onto an outstretched hand. Um, and the clinical features are often pain in the anatomical snuff box and when you telescope the thumb. So that's when you take the thumb and you push it in towards the wrist. Um, in this case, there's a fracture line across the waist of the scaphoid just here. Um, but the thing you need to know is that scaphoid fractures might not be visible on the acute x-ray that you take. And if you're suspicious that the patient has a scaphoid fracture, if they've clinically got a fracture, even if you can't see it on the x-ray, what you should do is immobilize them and then re-image them in seven to 10 days. Um, this might be repeating the x-ray or it might be going on to do a CT or an MR, but that's not something that you need to uh, know about in huge amounts of detail. You just need to know that they need to be immobilized and re-imaged. Um, and the reason that you um, don't want to miss these fractures is because there's, a, again, a high risk of avascular necrosis of the scaphoid. And if you get a vascular necrosis of the scaphoid, um, it can lead to long-term um, joint instability, um, wrist arthrosis, uh, arthritis, sorry, um, and it can be very debilitating, particularly if this is the dominant hand of the patient. Um, a Bennett's fracture. So a Bennett's fracture comes about um, from forced abduction of the thumb. So imagine uh, catching your thumb in something as you're walking or running, um, that kind of forced abduction and its specific features are an intra-articular fracture of the base of the first metacarpal. Um, so you can see it just here. So you've got this vertical fracture that runs um, into the joint space. So that's a Bennett's fracture. And then a Box's fracture. Um, I find this one pretty easy to remember because you can imagine um, how you'd get it. So it often comes about from punching a hard surface. Um, 
and it's a transverse fracture through the distal um, fifth metacarpal. So specifically the fifth. So if, it, if you had this fracture on the fourth, technically that's not a boxer's fracture. Um, um, but yeah, that's another common one that they'd like to show you um, in an exam. So just a few things that I just haven't had time to talk about, but just thought I'd let you know um, are things that you might need to know as a medical student. So in the shoulder, you should know about dislocations um, and humeral uh, neck and shaft fractures. In the elbow, you've got the olecranon fractures, which are pretty easy to see. Um, then you should also know about the anterior and posterior fat pad signs. Um, which suggests that there's an intraarticular fracture, if you can see those things. Um, in the forearm, I've already briefly discussed Montegui's and uh, Galeazzi's fractures. Um, in the spine, you've got peg fractures and um, crush or wedge fractures. I think it's uncommon they'll give you a spine because they're quite hard to interpret, um, but never say never. In the knee, you've got um, patella fractures, uh, which are usually pretty easy to see, um, and also lipohemarthrosis. Um, which is a sign of a tibial plateau fracture, and you should definitely know about that. Um, and in the foot, you've got uh, ankle fractures, and you should know what the Weber classification is, as well as knowing what Liz Franks and March fractures are. So, um, sorry, I've run a little bit longer than I thought I would. Um, just to cover, conclude about what I've been talking about. So, um, we talked about um, silhouettes on chest radiographs that help you uh, localize pathology within the chest. Um, there are specific patterns of um, abnormalities that you can see on chest and abdominal films that are characteristic for um, specific um, common pathologies that you should be familiar with. Um, and there are also several patterns of limb um, fractures that have eponymous names that you might be tested on in an exam. The one piece of advice I would give is if you're in an OSCE and you've got a fracture that you think probably has an eponymous name, but you can't remember it, that's not the end of the world by any means, because if you just describe the fracture, that is just as good as giving its eponymous name. So just being good at describing fractures um, is something that will really help you in an exam. So um, thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry it ran a slightly long. Um, I'll just bring up the Q&A in case um, anyone has uh, questions. Um, so there's a question here. Um, that says, um, why would the hyla be depressed in left lower lobe collapse? I didn't catch the explanation, sorry. Um, so the reason the hilum um, is depressed in left lower lobe collapse um, is because if you imagine um, you've lost the volume of the left lower lobe, um, and so the left lower lobe is shrunk down, and now the rest of the lung and the diaphragm and the mediastinum has to shift in order to account for that loss of volume. And the way it does that is by just moving things into that area. So that will be the left hemidiaphragm going up and it will be the hilum coming down, um, almost like it's being sucked down in order to do that. Um, hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, the next question I've got is, um, Ari, the sales sign, uh, what is the reason for the well demarcated border being visible when it's collapsed? And uh, that's because um, the, imagine the collapsed lung has absolutely no air in it, so it's got, um, it's just solid tissue. And next to it, you've got aerated lung, which obviously has air in it. So you've got that really clear silhouette again um, between aerated lung and solid tissue, and that's what makes it so well de demarcated. And that also helps you differentiate it from um, consolidation, which wouldn't be that well demarcated at all. Hopefully that makes more sense. Um, there's a question that says, um, why, uh, why more likely to be Hodgkin's? Um, so I think that was a question um, about the um, hyalur lymphadenopathy that I was talking about, bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy. Um, I don't know why it's more likely to be Hodgkin's, but Hodgkin's lymphoma is more likely uh, to cause um, hyalur lymphadenopathy than uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is by can't actually give you a scientific reason as to why, that's just an observation. Um, can you, next question is, can you tell how eggshell calcification um, of silicosis uh, might look like? Um, and why do we call them eggshell? So basically you, you call them eggshell because um, it's really thin, um, kind of 
it's it's thin rim calcification that you can imagine would look like an eggshell or what an eggshell might look like if you took an x-ray of it. Um, I, it's very hard for me to describe it without showing you a picture. Um, and I can't say I've ever seen eggshell calcification in uh, silicosis. Um, you often get eggshell calcification in any kind of um, lymphadenopathy that has become chronic. So you can get it in sarcoidosis. If you've got long standing sarcoidosis, um, the lymph nodes often calcify and it's the rims that calcify first um, in this patchy kind of way that looks like an eggshell. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a better explanation than that. Um, what uh, would a double SVC show up on a chest X-ray? I thought um, you can't even see one on a chest X-ray. Um, and what are the signs and symptoms of a double SVC? So, um, yeah, you can't always see an SVC on a chest X-ray. Um, sometimes, if you've done an AP, you can see it. Um, if it's rotated, if the X-ray is rotated, then you can see the SVC. Um, a double SVC might be visible because um, you might just see extra density or a wider mediastinum on the left than you'd expect to see. Um, it's completely asymptomatic. It doesn't matter. It's just variant anatomy. Um, and so you don't need to worry about it from a pathological point of view. Um, it's just something to consider if you're thinking of a widened mediastinum, but it wouldn't be the first thing that I'd consider um, because it is really quite rare. Um, so the next question is, um, out of curiosity, uh, why would a hernia repair as, as um, compared to other uh, incisions be associated with small bowel obstruction? Is it due to the um, type of incision or the use of mesh? So um, hernia repair, I'm not sure whether it's more likely to cause small bowel obstruction than any other incision into the abdomen, um, but the fact that you've had a hernia repair kind of gives you two reasons why you might get um, obstruction because either the repair can fail and you can then get another hernia which could obstruct or the fact that you've had a um, repair means that you've got a the incision and b the um, the mesh itself are both locations where you can get um, adhesions and then cause adhesion or bowel obstruction um, but yeah i'm not i'm I'm not 100% sure that it's more common than any other incision. Um, that said, I don't think I've ever seen like a cholecystectomy cause a um, small bowel obstruction before. It tends to be much lower um, abdominal incisions that do that. Um, uh, next question is, uh, what was the name of the white lines you only see in the small bowel loops on x-ray? So they're called valvular conoventes, um, and they are basically mucosal folds within um, the small bowel. Um, the next question is, is there a way to differentiate obstruction of different parts of the small bowel? So um, unfortunately there isn't, um, because the small bowel is very mobile, um, so it sits on a root of a mesentery, um, and it can basically move along any parts of, or it's very um, free within the abdomen, which means if you're seeing loops of small bowel in specific parts of the abdomen, you can't really be sure what, where along the root of the small bowel you're seeing those um, dilated loops. Um, so unfortunately, no, it's not like the large bowel where you know roughly where each of the um, parts of the large bowel should be sitting. Um, which gives you clues about where the obstruction might be. The small bowel, unfortunately, doesn't follow any rules like that. Um, so the next question um, is, in the previous radiograph, um, were the large bowel dilated um, in conjunction with the embryo sign? Um, so this was, fortunately, I'm not sure I can go back in my presentation. Oh, I can. Um, so going back to the embryo sign and this radiograph, um, so I assume you're talking about this. So this is um, going to be small bowel. Um, admittedly, you can't be sure looking at this, whether this is small bowel or large bowel, but definitely this area here is small bowel because you can see the valvular conoventes. 
Um, and there's also um, this loop is definitely small bowel as well. And that's exactly what you'd expect to see in um, embryo sign. Um, you wouldn't, so the large bowel might not be collapsed um, if it's quite acute, because obviously it takes time for the um, distal bowel to collapse down. Um, so just because you can see some large bowel doesn't mean that you don't have cecal um, obstruction, but if you've got it established, you would expect it to be collapsed. Um, next question was, um, do intertrochanteric fractures count as extravascular? So um, I assume by extravascular you mean extracapsular, um, and yes, they would. So um, the capsule basically as a general rule, you can imagine that the capsule um, attaches um, along the intratrochanteric ridge and most intratrochanteric fractures would happen slightly uh, distal to that. So they are extracapsular fractures and they're not at risk of avascular necrosis. So I think that was all the um, Q&A questions. So um, thank you again for listening. I'm sorry it was a little bit longer than um, I was hoping um, it to be, but I hope you found it useful. Um, I'm happy to answer um, any more questions. If you have uh, further questions about the talk, um, you can email Yes and he can pass them on to me and I'm happy to answer anything that you've got. Um, just want to say uh, good luck for your studies. I know with the COVID-19 situation, it's been very difficult um, for everybody and I think um, it's not necessarily obvious how big an impact it's going to have on people who are trying to train in medicine because you're missing out on so many opportunities. Um, so I just want to say good luck in everything.